What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another post-game video brought to you by the Jackal Den. I am your host and president, Daryl Keith Hendon, a.k.a. the Fairweather Rugby Fan. And joining me once again, the man, the inside man in the world of Dallas Jackals Rugby, Rick Collins. Welcome back, my old friend. Hey, if you're, if you're the Fairweather Rugby Fan, what are you doing here? Exactly. <laughs> you're not I should have great. walked away a long time ago after that uh shellacking we took this yeah. weekend um it really doesn't look bad on the scoreboard after the match and to me you know if we skip the first 15 minutes of the game uh it's we actually are in a winning position so <sighs> there's things that can be fixed i think going forward but also utah put in their you know their backups pretty early on. And so we got to see what we can do against backup players. Um, so I don't know. It, it's really hard to tell where we're at um, when we can give up that many points that quickly, but also then come back and make it a bit of a game at the end. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, it's just really frustrating. I'll, I'll put it that way. I had made a post, obviously, if any of you guys are on the Jackal Den Facebook saying this is painful. And really the most painful part about it was was uh, giving up four tries in 19 minutes. That was kind of what we did last year every single yeah. game. And we've actually had a pretty decent fair this year where we've scored first in a handful of games. And uh, obviously, you know, we went tit for tat with Seattle a few weekends ago, and we saw how that turned out real bad, real fast. But it was just, uh, yeah, for those of you that didn't watch the game, I mean, uh, uh, they're – Fly, hold on, let me make sure. What was McLeod? McLeod was their, their, their scrum half. Yeah. Had three tries within 19 minutes. Yeah. Keep it was, you fly uh, scrum half. Yeah, a gaping, the former Hawks Bay Magpie, so he's a Kiwi. We had a gaping hole on one side of the field that um, they exposed four times within the first 19 minutes of the game. Um, I for me personally, and you're a coach, Rick, I mean, when you give up that much, at what point are you like, are you doing it at 14 down? Are you doing it at 21 down? Are you making adjustments immediately? Or are you, are you, cause I mean, 19 minutes into the game, the hardest, and you're down 20 yeah, the hardest part is you have to accept that you've, you've failed as a coach because you've got to put players in the right position to win. And, you know, in this case, I, you know, you can't blame the players if they're just not able to to meet the requirements of the match. Um, and, and part of that is at halftime, you make the adjustment then, I would think. I mean, it sounds like you made it a little bit earlier than that. But, um, you know, it's really hard when you give up that many tries that quickly. You know, are you going to wait? Because you've got players on the bench that now if there's an injury late, you know, are you short? You're going to go out there with 14. So, I mean, it's it's a coaching failure to get to that, that point where you're giving up that many tries that quickly. And then you're going to need to, you know, send in reserves early. Uh, so, you know, the team that came out at halftime was a different team than was out there in the first half. Um the mono try was uh, well run by them in the second half, but um, we we had, I would say, most of the possession in the second half, and I think part of probably why, and I haven't gotten to see the replay of the first half because I, I had to miss it um, uh, for some family stuff. Um, I think what I'll see when I watch it is that um, we're we're giving up uh, space on the field, as we have been the entire season, and then we're we're not able to kind of adjust for that in game. And one of the things that this team has struggled to do, I think, is just get the right people out there, the right combination of players out there. Um, we've talked about different positions and you know players that we think should be out there, but. Um, you know, no, nothing's really worked this year. And we've played some decent matches, but there's not one time where I thought, wow, our, our especially on attack, 
that our attack looks dynamic, looks like, you know, they have um, not skill set, but they have kind of the playmaker mentality, right? It feels like we're just missing that piece um, that makes a difference between, a you know, a team that's right now on a, on a big losing streak um, versus a team, you know, like, let's say, um, uh, Utah or Seattle or San Diego that, you know, you can just tell, you say, they know what they're doing. They get out there, they know what the their um, opponent struggles with, they take advantage, and not only that, but they, they stomp on their throat. They don't let you get away with anything. So I just think that's where we're at right now, and I don't know that that changes before the end of the season, and the coaches have basically said, hey, this is where we're at. Um, we are going to see Kubia, uh, but it's going to be very late and not really, I mean, I don't know if it's worth our time at this point to even put him out there um, unless we've got him on a multi-year contract and he's going to stick around. He's going to be here for maybe a match or two. I don't know. Well, the big news coming out today, obviously, that Sam Gola has signed for another year here with the Jackals, which obviously uh, we, we have said from the offset from the scrimmage game, I mean, he stood out like a sore th- It was – uh, awesome to watch him line up against the likes of Cam Dolan and look like Cam Dolan was really nothing to him. And, yeah. you know, like we said, coming into the season, it was like, he's a flanker. He's a flanker. Uh, he has come into the lock position and completely dominated at it. And uh, obviously I think that's going to lead to a, a cap. He, I think he does make the squad personally. That's just my personal opinion. Um, it's a position you know, where we don't have a lot of youth depth. There's a lot of older guys in the log position for us that have been, you know, on this USA squad for, you know, 8, 10, 12 years. And so guys like Greg Peterson and, you know, Dolan are aging out. Um, uh, Mahoney is not a, a young bird. So there's a lot of guys who are starting to age out there at, at log for us. And, you know, I, I think he's going to be a, a great addition to the Eagles squad. I, I agree. I think he makes the team. I think we see him in four years in Australia. No question. Uh, he will be at the next World Cup. Will he be playing for the at that time? What's that? Will he be playing for the Jackals at that time? I, I, I highly doubt it, personally. I, I am happy that he did re-sign another year here. Uh, he has definitely been um, probably one of the brightest spots on this team this season. And uh he has continued to go out, and, and he he earns his stripes every game. He's one of those guys that never gives up. You see him; he's always in the mix with everything. And uh, you know, to think that he's also a rookie. I mean, yeah. he is a real rookie. Like this is his first professional rugby he's ever played in his life. And uh, even having a moment to talk to him after the game a bit, he he still has a very good positive vibe about it, despite the situation that he's uh, he's kind of been into. But um, I think that is, you know, going forward, cool. We will have him next year. That is definitely something we needed back. You need that back in the war chest. And uh, I think going forward, I think we just need to try to build some positive momentum going into the off season, obviously. Um, you know, I, I still don't think we're in as bad a place as Toronto. That, that granted, yes, they almost – upset somebody this weekend but it was just i still think their problems versus our problems ours are not nearly i, I feel like what we're missing is is a world-class back yeah or a wing i think we've got utility enough centers but we still need a back or a wing we need world-class we need somebody with multiple caps at an international level uh, you know, a Christian Dyer type guy, perhaps, or something like that. But that's just we. To me, we lack size and strength at wing and at fullback. And that's just my seen, I mean, they're putting Satama out there at wing quite often because they want somebody who's a little bit bigger who's going to defend on the wing. And I don't, um, I don't dislike that. It's it's not perfect. I think obviously, if you had a Dyer or a mini ham or somebody like that, that would be amazing. Uh, but we just, we don't. And I don't think anything is changing before the end of the season. 
I think what we need to start thinking about is like, what is this team going to look like next year? Um, we're going to have a few draft picks. Are are we going to keep draft picks? Are we going to do what we've been doing with with picks? With unfortunately, with American and Canadian players, which is just trade them for international slots or for you know money. I I don't have a confident um belief that you know going forward we're going to really invest in american canadian talent um especially through the draft and um obviously through local you know uh, recruiting which hasn't happened in the last you know year and a half almost so it, it is what it is at this point um are we going to lose players to miami uh that's still to be uh, determined, but uh, you know it wouldn't be surprising. So, well, at least we won't lose Sam Gola. <laughs> we've got Sam for another year, unless he gets a big contract somewhere else. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I think we will have Sam next year. I think it's going to be the year after where we're going to see he's going to get some offers. He has another amazing year with the Jackals and MLR, and you know maybe even gets beefier and and stronger. Um, he's going to get abroad in Europe for sure. Yeah, he, um, it's kind of one of those things, you know, we, we were at the trainings last week. We saw what was going on. We, we both talked in length with the general manager and with the coaching staff. And I felt like it was a very positive meeting for the most part, but I f still feel like we got some questions answered, but we had a lot more. I felt like leaving, I had a lot more than what I walked in with. And I don't know if you, obviously you nodding your head, you agree with me that we both had I had more questions walking away than I had walking in. More, Dallas Jackals, more questions than answers. Um, I think that, you know, the biggest question is, what what is the goal of this franchise? Is it to win MLR games? Is it to develop American, Canadian talent? Um, I, I don't know right now. I mean, it feels like um, my honest perception is that it feels like an Argentine uh, development side. Right. And we're just developing we're we're a place for players to, you know, develop outside of Pampas and Doggos. So is is that gonna change? I don't think so. Not when you have uh ownership group that is now partially made up of Argentines and GM who's Argentinian and coaches that are Argentinian. I, they're gonna keep going back to that well because that's what they know. Um and you know. I try to be a little bit more like on the like it's 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 hopeful hoping that we're not going to continue just going to the club rugby level side of Argentine players like are we going to try and pull some from Europe to come over here we got obviously Thomas Baravale our hooker who is out with an injury but if he had 61 caps with Benetton in the URC are we going to start getting guys like that coming over or are we going to continue just to get guys with U20 caps for Argentina? If that's the case going forward, I can pretty much tell you that the results will stay the same. We're going to have to get some guys with substantial caps at a higher level than MLR. At a professional, at a high level professional level. Show rugby, if I think, you know, like it makes me really like as much as last season was bad we had somebody like Chris Pinnell mm -hmm. who had what 200 some odd caps in the yeah. premiership. Now, was he at his best here? No, he was at the end of his career, but honestly, I would kill for a Chris Pinnell right now. Yeah. I, there, the leadership thing is definitely interesting. The, you know, our, our main leader is Vara and when he's 25, 26, um, you know, it's not terrible to have a young guy as your as your captain, but I prefer the 25, 26 year old with 20 international caps for the Pumas um, rather than a guy that's just done you 20 hasn't. I mean, he's a guy that the expectation is he will place, you know, some for Pumas and probably is currently in the pool to play uh, for Pumas, but, you know, hasn't gotten those caps. Um, I want I want. I would like, as you say, and I, you know, I don't, it doesn't have to be um, a guy like Pinnell who's much older, but somebody who, who has significant number of international caps uh, for their country and, um, you know, kind of has a lot of experience at a professional club level. 
So not somebody who's coming from, you know, Del Rosario or wherever in Argentina that's just club rugby. And it, don't get me wrong, their club rugby is probably better than our MLR right now. But I want a guy who's been playing Premiership, who's been playing URC, who's been playing Minor 10, who's been playing um, Super Rugby, Cup, who's been yeah. playing Super Rugby. Yeah. Get, us, get us some of those guys to come in. Because if you look at all the other teams, they have USA Eagles, and then they have two or three guys who have played at that kind of level of rugby, and that's the winning combination. And it gels around them. Yes, the U USA Eagles will be the most capped guys on the team, but then they'll have a guy with maybe eight caps for South Africa or five caps for South Africa or handful of caps for Australia, but maybe 40 or 50 caps playing for, like, Waratahs or yeah. 40 or 50 caps playing for Worcester or Worcester or – uh, Harlequins or whatever, you know, like we don't have that. Like it's, it's something I brought it up early in the season in a pregame video, how every other team has like a ridiculous amount of international caps. And uh, after talking to Pitt, Pedro, Peter, Pitt, Emhoff, I found out he had four caps playing yeah. against Uruguay, Brazil, like just, you know I what know. I mean? Scrub, scrub, scrub team. Yeah. Scrub teams, but that's more caps than you or I have. So it's <laughs> like you've got him, you've got Zeiss with like four caps. So that's eight. And then the most capped international we have on our team is our number eight. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously he's having a absolutely killer season. He's one of the top tacklers in the league. But wouldn't it be nice for us to have a top tackler and then a guy in the top three or four in, in scoring or meters run? We don't have any of that. None of those guys. We're, we're not on any of those lists. The list that you want to be on, we are not on them. Yeah, list. we're only on tackles. That's it, because we just play defense so much of the damn time. And, I mean, like, it, it's getting to, like, this point where we have these conversations after games, and there's some positivity, but for a lot of it, it's kind of just like, what the hell? You know, like, we, it's almost like a – you go to buy a used car and they tell you it's great. And you get about 10 miles down the road and you're like, Hey, this is a lemon guys. Yeah. We have a lemon. <laughs> yeah. Like, our team is a lemon. Well, it's just like, we can't go back to the dealership and, and sell it back to them. Yeah. We and it's have the lemon until, you know, the off season. And then I think the biggest thing for us is we need to have a really bang up off season. This needs to be an off season where, we have, you know, three draft picks who are going to play minutes. And we have Sam Gola getting to USA Eagles, uh, playing this fall uh, for the Eagles and the uh, whatever Autumn Internationals or whatever they're calling friendlies or whatever they're calling them this year. Since um, we're not going to the World Cup. Right, right. And then we also need to have two or three signings. Um, if, if it's, you know, uh, the fullback for Chile, the starting fullback sign him if it's you know a lightly used wing for um bristol sign him like those are the signings we need to have come in guys that are playing at high level of rugby who are playing internet somewhat internationally um at least player pool for england or something like that right i mean we just need guys that are playing high level rugby to come in bringing in new 20 guys is great but the just the experience of of knowing what to do in the moment just isn't there for this team and you can just tell there's there the that you know boating waka we need that guy we need that difference maker in a difference maker position to to kind of fulfill where this team needs to go and i just don't have the confidence right now that this rugby ops group will put that together during this offseason, but I would love to be proven wrong. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I kind of wonder if have you had any contact with the Iron Worker Boys, Scott and company up there? I'm pretty sure they're pretty piff ticked off with Bunwaka coming back to yeah. England. Um, I, I think that blows that that complete division completely over right there. Uh, although I still. Uh, I'll stick yeah, with that. Playoffs, anything can happen. I think it gel. I mean, I think, you know, New England, I think San Diego has basically nailed down the top spot in the West. New England will more than likely win the East. I think it's going to come down to playoffs. 
uh, who's you know you just don't know what's going to happen. Seattle could beat San Diego. Have you have you gotten to watch the Seattle versus Houston game yet? I watched a little bit of it, and they, they are clinical man. Yeah, but Houston played great in the first half, and apparently not so good in the second. Seattle half. Seattle was clinical in the second half, and a lot of it was led from the back by uh, by Adrian. He has really gelled with that team. His style of play fits yeah. them to a T. Yeah. They let him be a quarterback. They let him run the show from the back. And they let him do his thing. He doesn't have to do it all by himself either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got a lot of talent to in front uh, of him. help him do it. So it's it's really disappointing to see a guy like that go and then do what he's doing. Um, I love it for him, but it's it's terrible for us. Um, obviously, yeah. you know, having a playmaker, what he did last year offensively for us was uh, pretty magical at times. We had some matches where it was like, we should not be in this match at all. And he kept us in them. And he kept us in them. I get it. He had kicking issues, but outside of like kicking conversion issues, he had that. But like everything else about him, he could run the, he could run the engine room. Yeah. He could be in the engine room running it. And it, it, I, I, I've gone back and watched every game since he's left here just because I want to see how he's doing. And it's like, he definitely found the right place to be. Um, I'm wow. trying to think if there's maybe like old glory would have been a decent fit for him as well in terms of style of play, but him and, Dan, him and Danny at nine and 10, yeah, right? Wow. That would have been disgustingly yeah. good because uh, they both would have gelled well with each other. I, I think wherever Adrian ended up, he would have been just fine. He would have landed on his feet regardless. He's a great player, a great dude. And I'm sure he gets along with everybody, but it's just kind of like one of those things where you look back and you realize, like, damn, they really made a really horrible mistake in letting him go. And I guess, you know, we'll see uh, what that money gets used for. Did it get used for this season? Was that the money we sent for Kubia to, to come up here for two matches? That would be really disappointing if that's the case. Uh, because that unless Kubia is on a multi-year deal um, – I mean, he's going to be the most skilled player we have, I think, if he gets here. Well, what is? I don't even really know what his bat is. He just been playing. He's so he's been yeah Juarez for three or four seasons. He's been up with Pumas uh, as one of their centers. Um, so he's a, he's a player that is probably a, a step or two ahead of uh, Vara in terms of playing Pumas. Like I think the expectation is he's going to be maybe a starter in the next year or two. Oh, wow. That would be really nice to have somebody like that, obviously. Um, but we just have to remain – we'll see what happens with what happens. Obviously, we have an early game this next week, uh, 11 a.m. kickoff from the – do they call it the Viper Den? Uh, oh, I don't think they used a, a, a snake term anymore because it used to be the, the, the snake pit or something like that. Yeah. And uh, they've gone away from the whole snake ideology thing. Um, I'll have to look it up. But well, it's if I didn't, yeah. it's got like some uh, um, uh, sponsor now is is sponsoring their field. Did you get it? You obviously saw the the post from the Dallas Jackals on Facebook. The big D goes into the big peach. Um, Little tongue in cheek there. I thought, hey man, you know, like, uh, what have you got to lose at this point? Be as vulgar as you want. Um, I I'm wondering what we get when we get to Atlanta. How our boys are going to do? What the weather is going to be like? Obviously, these are all factors. We've got two on the road. We're not back at Choctaw until like the tenth of next month. Yeah. So we're on the road for a bit. We got two on the road and then a bye week, bye and then week. we're back. Yeah, I think the bye week's in between the two matches on the road. So we, we have ATL, then we have bye, then we have New York, and then we have the two home matches. Uh, we've got uh, – yeah, it's going to be an interesting little run there to finish out the season. And hopefully, like I said, get some momentum. I don't know if it's going to happen. I would like it to. If it does, cool. If it doesn't, I, I wouldn't be 100% hey, not either. ATL looks uh, weak right now, at least based on what we saw with – uh, them getting a tie against Toronto. Now they scored a bunch, but their defense looked leaky. So 
Um, you know, I think one of the things for this club is we've got to get out early. We've got to get a couple of tries in the first half minimum, and then we've got to let our defense kind of just slow things down in, in the second half. You saw what we did defensively against Utah in the second half. We dominate. We dominate. We let our defense do their job, and they, you know, and obviously they brought in a lot of their. It didn't help with the two yellow cards either, obviously. Yeah. But uh, you know, it, it's almost as if like this team is like a team of two teams. We we on the one side of it, you know, we're really dominant at scrum time, good dominant set piece play, that kind of thing. But then the other side of it is, it, is it's like we've got more leaks than the British Navy when it comes to our defense in the back. Like it's it's almost like we've got like really really good up front really really bad in back like why are we, you know like it's not i would give up a little bit of that talent in the front just to have a little bit more in the back because then we could actually it's score more frustrating this year than last year because this year i feel like we think okay we're going to be in quite a few of these matches we're going to have chances to win matches and then we're just it, it's kind of like a team full of rookies we we're, don't know what to do to win games right and last year it was just like, well, we're we're in a different league than everybody else, and that's not the good way. <laughs> last year was when is this going to end? <laughs> like, when is this going to end? We just need it to be over with. It's just it's a watch of a season. Well, and we just were happy to have a team at that point. It had been five years that we've been told that we we're going to have a team, and finally we had a team. So we were just happy to have a team. Now we're Hey, the expectations were high. They brought in a, a new sports op group, new business management group, and it just it hadn't worked. And we brought in one of the top scrum coaches in the world, and it's made a difference, but it hasn't changed us. It changed the losing the win loss count at all. And I, I, I think the league got better. Oh, for sure. But not to the level that where we should be and where we're at. I don't yeah. think it got that much better. And I'm scared because I think next year the league's going to get even better. I so think do I. More so do I. That you've already seen what Houston's done and turn it around. Toronto's going to be – has to be better than this year. Toronto – it's been a disaster for Toronto this year. Has to be better for them. I think NOLA is somewhat better next year. You can see they're already – their play has been better this DC year. DC will be a playoff team next year. He's going to be a playoff team next year. And I think Chicago is going to be good. After a year of these guys kind of finally gelling together, um, it's been it's been a quick, you know, pickup for them. And you could see already they almost won yesterday against so, a good team. Yeah. With Miami joining the league next year, what do you think the realignment does? Do you think we get Chicago in the West or do you think we get NOLA in the West? Well, Chicago's already in the West. Okay. Well, do, do you yeah, think? I think, we keep, I think we keep Chicago in the It's already um, uh, – we're, we're not balanced as it is. So, right now we have um, – oh, no, it is balanced. So, it'll just go unbalanced the way it was last year, right? We had seven in the West with Austin – yeah. And LA. LA. And then there were six in the East. It was the same teams in the East. So I think they'll just go unbalanced again. Um, we'll have seven teams in the East, six in the West. And then hopefully, you know, we'll get a team in. My guess would be either LA. San Francisco, Vegas, or LA. I think LA gets the team. I, I think just because it's LA, uh, I don't. The team still is there, technically. They're just not in operation. So that franchise still exists, but because the sale never went through, it's just in a holding pattern. So somebody could go ahead and basically get in sort of cheap, not, and, and they've talked to, uh, they talked to George about this before he stepped down. He said, they're not going to get in for free, but I think that he, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge was that it would be significantly cheaper than trying to create it, a brand and um, club from, uh, you know, foundation. So somebody, I would be surprised if somebody did not buy the LA franchise and restart it with a different name. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see the same for Austin. Uh, yeah. I just don't, I don't, it's look, 
how many how many times I went down to Austin for five total games over their existence. And they, they just didn't really have a lot of fan support. It was just, I mean, obviously in the beginning, because they were so bad, nobody went to their games. Then even once they started having success, you just didn't see a lot of fan support at their game. Like they had fans, but it wasn't like, if you took the amount of fans we average in our stadium and put it in theirs, I think it would look fuller than yeah, what oh, they were yeah. averaging. And it's just, I just don't see it happening for Austin. Love the town. It's great. It's a fun place to visit. I just don't see it happening for the them biggest, anytime soon. The biggest problem is going to be location to play. It's too expensive to play in, in actual Austin. Um, the only option would be playing at a Q2 or like an old high school stadium or something like that. And I don't think they, they would want to do that. I, I just don't. There's not a very clear path forward for Austin to restart, at least at this point. Now, I think further down the road, once these clubs are worth a lot more and we see, you know, more of the larger uh, media um, uh, cities, um, you know, having clubs, I think Austin's possible down the road, but I agree with you. I just don't see a path forward at least in the near future. I would like to see a Kansas City or St. Louis club personally, just to kind of fill it out in the middle of the country. Um, but that's just – Philadelphia wouldn't be bad in the east. But as far as the west goes, I just – you're right. I don't see it. Um, may, maybe – you know what? Maybe an Arizona club wouldn't yeah. be a bad idea. But There's been smoke around uh, GCU. Uh, their program has gotten pretty big, and there's a new stadium there. Uh, there has been smoke out of there, but nothing, no fire as of yet. So I, I, I don't know that they have something anytime soon, but I think Phoenix is not a bad idea in the future for sure. I mean, late season games would probably suck. <laughs> there they would the, have to, they'd have to go to Toronto and Chicago and, and for those late it, it's yeah. Um, late in the season. So before we, we kind of end this one, because this was a good one. We didn't really talk about the game. I think we talked about the club more than anything. We're, we're, we're really about. talking about, let's be honest. And, hey, look, we had a great second half. Let, let, let's just jump through those stats real quick. Um, so we get uh, we finally get on the board at the 28th minute with uh, Revel Pitt going across. Uh, we end up getting Moroni over at the 33 minutes. So we go in 28-14 at the half with a bit of uh, momentum. Obviously, an early penalty in the second half to Utah. They kick. They do convert, get the three. They are kicked the penalty for three. Uh, and then the veteran, the big veteran, yeah. Juan Pablo Zeiss, uh, the former Puma at the 45th and 68th minute, obviously earning uh, over on the Jackal Den Facebook page. He is running away with the votes for man of the match, at least for us. Um I guess the only negative – I've got one other negative thing to say about the game, and I'm going to say this to the Christensen and Shoemaker families who made it all the way out yeah. from Arizona and Utah for these matches, and their kids didn't even get to get on the damn field. That was – to me, that was that was pretty, pretty bad. Um, yeah. I spoke to both of those families at the end of the game and, and they were obviously upset, not just at the result, but also the fact that the kids didn't even get to play. Yeah. Um, that was a pretty. Yeah. This is the game battle. where they probably should have emptied the bench around the 60th minute mark for sure. And just let those guys get out there and run. I mean, cause we've seen Danny do it. We saw him do it against Seattle. Yeah. He will get out there and play like Hot Wheels, like a crazy man. And we didn't even get to see that. I felt really bad for their families. Like that was really embarrassing for me as a, you know, as the president of this this fan club. It was kind of like saying, well, sorry, guys. You know, I was hanging out with the, sh the shoemakers before the game. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just hanging out with those guys and just chit-chatting and just getting to know them because, you know, like, he was here a bit at the end of last season as well. They knew what the team was like last year. And, you know, it's, it's kind of the same conversation you got to have with all the American kid parents and say, Hey, you know, you could say they don't like Americans, but what American kid is getting dressed for every game? Yeah. And also I think with, with these young guys, just being at training with this coaching staff and with these Argentinian players, there's no doubt they're getting better. So the, the question 
the question to me is not necessarily are they going to get game time with the Jackals. They need to just get game time somewhere. Period. Period. Weekends. There needs to be development matches. They've got to. They've got to get these players game time because you can practice all you want. Sure, they're going to get better in practice, but as I've said many times, you only get better by playing the game. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that Juan Pablo Zeiss has to be both of our man of the match. Um, he's the fan club man of the match, as far as uh, what I could tell from the voting. Um, I also want to throw as you know, uh, my three players. Uh, would be uh, Tincho. I thought he had a great game, and you know, for what we've seen so far from him this year, this might have been one of his better matches. Um, he the kicks were much better. He converted three of four. Um, it would have been nice to see him attack the line more. He just doesn't really. That's not his thing. Uh, but I thought he looked cleaner. The ball was getting out cleaner. He was making better decisions. I think. So at least at least that's looking better. And then uh, my third is Gola again. I just think every week he's showing why he should be a USA Eagle. Um, I'll go I'll go with Gola as well as one of mine. And my third star is going to go to uh, probably Revel Pitt. Just our our front row this year. That would be like okay if we can secure anybody for next season. I would secure every guy that's worn one through three this season for us. Hey, the, the, that is arguably the best front row in MLR and probably in all of the Americas right now. But, that, like, it's just been – and everybody got better around him. Obviously, even Dewey coming in late last season, and, like, he doesn't even look like the same guy this year. Yeah. Uh, I was informed he – Uh-oh. I've has – there been in oh, losing Keith again. So it will we'll get Keith back here in a second as he's frozen mid mid yelling. Uh, I think the, the biggest piece for us is maintaining uh, our player depth through next season. The, the hardest part of this has been the turnover for three straight years of having, uh, you know, a year that didn't exist with players that had already been signed and we let them go and a coach that we let go. And then we have another year with whole new coaching staff. Um, and then, um, you know, um, a whole different set of players because we had let go all the players from the year before. I think we brought in or can maintain three of those players, something like that. And then this year, again, new rugby ops, bringing in a whole new group of players. So, I'd love to just see some continuity going into next year, and hopefully we will get that. But um, we will leave it at that. Sorry, Keith, is, uh, his connections died clearly on us. So um, this is the show by the fans, for the fans. 